Hello, this is uh, True Crime Nightmare and my name is Jane Reed, and this is episode 47 of this podcast. This case comes from Australia and involves a young girl who was tragically murdered. Her killer escaped justice for decades until he was finally caught and locked up. The victim's name is Kylie Mabry and she was only six years old when she was murdered. Her body was dumped and discovered the very next day. Kylie Mabry was born on the 24th of October of um, 1978. She had lived in a place called Preston, which is an inner city suburb of Melbourne in Australia. Kylie had lived with her younger sister, Rebecca, and their mother, Julie, in a place called Gregory's Grove. Kylie attended a local primary school at the time. Kylie had liked to help out at home and would sometimes carry out small errands, such as going to the nearby shop to buy items that were needed for the family. On the afternoon of the 6th of November of 1984, which was Melbourne Cup Day in Australia, which is a special day for people working in Melbourne, it was seen to be similar to a bank holiday in the UK and would be celebrated by some people as such. So some people would would have been off work this day and enjoying themselves. Kylie Mabry had gone to the shop at the end of her road to purchase a bag of sugar for her mother. Kylie did not have to cross a road and it was still light outside. So it was not deemed particularly risky to do this at, at this time in the 1980s. In 1984 in Australia and, and in many other countries, it was not unusual for a child of that age to to carry out simple errands like this, especially for such a short distance and in daylight. The shop was located on a road called Plenty Road. Kylie had made it to the shop and she did actually buy the bag of sugar. Witnesses had remembered seeing her not only in the shop but afterwards walking home after she had left the shop when Kylie had not returned home after about half an hour because she had left shortly after 5.30. Um, So when six o'clock came round in the evening her mother became concerned. Julie Mabry and a neighbour went out looking for little Kylie. Unfortunately Julie Mabry soon discovered that a witness had allegedly seen Kylie get into a car and had been driven away. The vehicle that the witness described was a Holden station wagon and the vehicle was said to have been a a white car. Not much was known and no information was put forward to help identify the the driver of the car however. The police were soon notified and a search of the area was conducted but no sign of Kylie Mabry was discovered at this time. Julie Mabry had to endure a sleepless night tormented about where her daughter could be and what had happened to her since she had left home just to carry out a simple errand at the local shop. Unfortunately, Kylie's body was discovered the very next day in the early afternoon. Her body was found at a place called Donald Street by an electrician who was working in the area. The area where Kylie's body was eventually found had actually already been searched by the police the previous evening, but her body had not been there at that time, according to the police. Kylie Mabry, it was soon discovered, had died of asphyxiation. She had also been raped and she had many injuries, including internal injuries and other injuries to her body. The autopsy had also shown up traces of a drug called diazepam, which is a strong sedative, especially Uh, for someone so young and probably unused to taking it. So she had been drugged by her attacker before death, it would seem. The murder of a six-year-old girl who, you know, died so tragically was obviously front-page news and there was a lot of media interest right from the very start, as you can imagine. The police who investigated Kylie's murder at that time did not have a lot of evidence to go on for that for that time but they did manage to obtain a sample from the crime scene that would prove useful many years later 
The sample would ultimately contain a DNA profile, but at the time the technology had only just been invented properly and it was still a few years away from being successfully used to solve or to help solve crimes. It was definitely something that would help solve the murder eventually, but not in 1984, unfortunately, but at least they were able to obtain some evidence. All of the evidence and statements from potential witnesses suggested that Kylie Mabry had walked to the local shop, bought the sugar and was on her way home. At the time, it would appear that someone had spotted her and had decided to abduct her. There were witness, witness evidence of Kylie being seen getting into a vehicle, apparently. The police also believed that she had been held for a few hours by her abductor due to the fact that the place where her body was eventually found had already been searched the evening of her disappearance. Also, the sexual assault suggested that the murderer had kept her for a while, so had also, she had also been drugged, so in all probability he had taken her somewhere first before leaving her body where it was found the very next day. At first, the police were unsure if Kylie had been targeted by someone that she knew or if a stranger had just come across her. They also did not know if he had gone out to attack and kill a child or if the opportunity was there and he simply decided to snatch the little girl. The community must have been extremely worried that such an evil person was still out there and could potentially do the same thing to another young child. Even member of Members of Kylie's own family came under suspicion at the beginning of the murder investigation. Her own grandfather was a suspect for a time, as was her uncle. No actual charges were actually brought against either man, but apparently the media made a lot of noise about the men, which most of us know that they can distort facts and hype up the stories in order that they sell more copies of their newspapers but the police have a job to do so we'll question everyone linked to the victim. Other potential suspects came under the radar over the many years that followed. A man called Robert Lowe became a suspect for a while. He was already in prison because he had been convicted of murdering a young girl. The girl that he had been convicted of killing, Sherry Beasley had been murdered in 1991, so about seven years after Kylie Mabry. Cherie Beasley had also been six years old at the time of her murder. It was thought that at the time of Kylie's murder, Robert Lowe had been in the area. It was also reported that he had apparently been acting strangely. He had been questioned about acting in an offensive manner towards school children, but I'm not really sure exactly what that means but um, that's what was reported and according to police reports they did speak to him. This suspect did not turn out to be very good however because his DNA did not match the profile on record. This was years after Kylie's murder when DNA was routinely being used to help solve many not only new cases of rape and murder but also old cases as well. The media continued over the years to report on the unsolved murder case and also a cold case team in the police department was set up in 2014. Because of the interest and all of the work carried out, justice would eventually be done in regards to not only Kylie Mabry but also her family as well. A man would be identified in the media in the murder case that had previous convictions in relation to assaults against children. This man is called Gregory Davies. Gregory Davies had, along with many men, been questioned in regards to the rape and murder of Kylie Mabry shortly after her body had been found in 1984. At that time, no evidence was found against him, however, and he was only one of many men who had been questioned and who had been cleared by the police at that time. It would later transpire that Gregory Davies had been convicted of attacking a 14-year-old girl with a hammer and she had somehow managed to fight him off. This was before six-year-old Kylie had been killed. 
The hammer attack on the teenager was horrendous and he had also tried to sexually assault the girl. It was also determined that at that time of Kylie, at the time of Kylie's death, Gregory Davies was known to drive a similar vehicle to the one that had been seen in the area at the time of the little girl's disappearance. He was finally arrested and charged with the rape and murder of Kylie Mabry and the case went before the court in May of 2017. Once a DNA sample was taken and it was confirmed as being a match to Gregory Davis, he decided to plead guilty to Kylie's rape and murder. He was well into his 70s by now and he was sentenced to serve a minimum of 28 years in prison. He will not, will not be eligible for, to apply for parole until 2045. By this time he will be over 100 years old if still alive. A closer look at Gregory Davis would indicate that he was always a danger to young girls. Many instances were uncovered as well as the hammer attack on the teenage girl who he had not known prior to attacking her. There were other incidents as well. Unfortunately, the the family member, two family members of Kylie Mabry, who had been under some scrutiny for some reason, despite having not been charged at all with any offences against Kylie, both committed suicide. Her grandfather killed him, killed himself in 1985, so not long after her murder. Her uncle killed himself in 1987. Not much is really known publicly about these family members so I won't speculate as to why they were suspected or even if they were suspected that seriously maybe they were just suspected along with other people in the local area but they're dead so they can't defend themselves anyway. Luckily although it took over 30 years the person who did actually murder little Kylie Mabry will now rot in prison for what he did to the little girl. After the court case and the guilty verdict, which was him basically pleading guilty anyway, the family of Kylie Mabry must have been so relieved that such an evil person could not hurt anyone else. They must have been so happy on behalf of Kylie that justice, however late, was eventually served. Fortunately, the murder case had really remained in the public eye even many, many years after it had occurred. The police were also active in trying to track down her killer and they had responded quickly from the very first report of Kylie being missing. Also, the DNA sample had thankfully been stored correctly over the years so that it could still be used over 30 years later. The timeline for what is known and also what is believed to have happened on the 6th of November 1984 is as follows. At 4.30pm that day, after having watched the Melbourne Cup horse race on, on TV at a local pub, Kylie Mabry, her mother and a neighbour, all went back to the Mabry house. At approximately quarter past five, Kylie was asked to go and buy a bag of sugar from the local shop just down the road from the family home. Kylie was familiar with the local area, despite only being six years old. She had got some money from her mother to pay for the sugar and had le had left the house. She had been wearing a red top and was barefoot, according to reports. She was also wearing light brown trousers at the time. Kylie was known to have made it to the shop at about 5.30pm. She had bought the bag of sugar and she had then left the shop to walk back home. It was daylight and witnesses had seen her. However, she had not returned home when she was expected. So at about six o'clock, Julie Mabry and her neighbour set about trying to track the little girl down. They walked to the shop and went inside, but they, they could not find Kylie anywhere. Julie Mabry then called the police and reported her daughter missing. By seven o'clock that evening, the police were already out looking for Kylie and did so for as long as they could before nightfall. It is believed that after Kylie Mabry had left the shop, she had been spotted by Gregory Davies. He had been driving past when he is thought to have just seen the girl on her own and abducted her there and then. It is then thought that he had driven the short distance to his home, which was empty at the time, 
of anybody else and had kept Kylie there for a few hours. He then drugged and sexually assaulted her and eventually killed her. He later then dumped her body where she was discovered the very next day. The area that the body was found had been searched the night before by the police, so that is how they realised that she must have been somewhere else beforehand. This is a very sad case. Kylie had only been going to buy sugar and trying to help out. And it was only the local shop that she was familiar with. And it was very close to the family home and in daylight. So the risks for the time were not high, in my opinion. She did not have to cross any roads either, which made it even safer. Julie Mowbray, Kylie's mother, moved away to Queen to Queensland after her daughter's murder. Although a fairly private person, she did give a few interviews to the newspapers over the years. She gave an interview on the 10th, an 10th anniversary of Kylie's death and again on the 15th anniversary. She had obviously wanted to try and keep her daughter's name in the public arena so that hopefully the murderer would be found, which is what happened in the end, thank goodness. Gregory Davis is known to have had a very unhealthy interest in young girls, to say the least, as well as the teenage girl that he had attacked prior to Kylie. He had other convictions as well. And he, you know, he lived quite close to the area, so whether he'd seen her before, we don't know whether he just came across her, but anyway... So a lot of things went against him, but but fortunately the police also had some DNA evidence which could be matched so that it's known for sure that Gregory Davis was the one that committed the rape and murder of Kylie Maybury. So what is known about Gregory Davis? It is known that he had also convictions for sexually abusing six young children and he was also suspected in abusing another six children. He had spent two and a half years in prison when convicted in 1996 of child abuse. He had either known all of the victims or he had easy access to them at any rate. But he did get caught and he was put away. Not for very long though, he was only put away two and a half years um, so obviously he was a very very dangerous person he had been married at, uh, at one point and he had at least one child of his own um, a daughter who has gone on record as apologising for what her father had done to his many victims he ruined so many lives over many years and deserves to be locked away. It is a pity that he had not been identified as Kylie's killer many years before so that other young girls would have been safe from his evil clutches. Gregory Davis was in his mid-70s when he was finally put away, but despite a few years in prison for prior sexual offences, he spent a lot of years free to do whatever he wanted to. And although it took a long time to solve this case, at least the DNA evidence was there to support the conviction um, and also the police and the media had kept on top of the case they they kept highlighting it so it wasn't as though everyone had forgotten about it apart from the family of Kylie Mabry but people were still keen to find her killer even 30 years later so at least at least justice was done in the end but it did obviously take a very long time Anyway, thank you very much for listening to this episode. Bye. Credits for this episode go to abc.net.au, express.digital.com, ninenews.com.au. Uh, there was also an Australian podcast that I listened to on um, YouTube and it was the Australian True Crime podcast which had a lot of information which was very good. Thank you very much for listening again. Bye. Bye.